Alana, Shannon, and Carly, welcome to the Soccer Queens podcast. Thank you for having us. I am pumped for you guys to be here. So if you guys don't know who these ladies are, like seriously, you live in a cave. (laughs) They are the ladies behind Soccer Girl Problems. And I just got my proof of my new book in last night. And these ladies actually wrote the foreword to the book. And I was thinking about who I wanted to write the foreword. And I definitely wanted female athletes, obviously, because it's called Female Athlete High Performance. But I also wanted ladies who the audience could really relate to. And when I reread your Ford, you guys, I was like, oh my gosh, that was my exact college experience. All of the ups and downs, the the fitness tests and getting sick before the fitness tests and being anxious about it and just all the pressure. And I think you guys really convey just such a good message to kick off the book. So my first question is, What were some of the things you guys did in terms of performance training throughout college? It's an interesting question you ask, (laughs) because I feel like when we were in college, and I am using this a little bit as an excuse, there weren't the resources such as your book available to us and um, the accessibility of information on, on things like Instagram and, you know, learning about proper nutrition and the proper proper ways to work out and what are ways and habits that we can have that actually negatively, you know, hurt our performance on the field. So I feel like a lot of us, when I speak for the three of us, we ate incorrectly before games. We always talk about, we would have pregame waffles before practice and games and things like that. Um, And then even in terms of performance, we were really just listening to what we were told to do as collegiate athletes by our strength and conditioning coach. And it turned out that a lot of that stuff wasn't the best way to be training for our position on the field. I don't mean to speak for both of you guys, but anything to add to that, Carly and Shen? We just felt pretty much not supported the way that athletes do now. We didn't have the education. And if we did have any sort of education or guidance, we felt that it was very outdated and it didn't support the female athlete. Like it may have been working for men and like male sports, But whatever it was that was happening, like it just didn't make, it didn't tailor to the female athlete. And that's why we just feel like your whole book and everything that you're doing specifically for women is so powerful and everyone needs to read it. (laughs) I agree with both what Carliana said. I think that at the time we didn't have the resources and now things like your book and there's just so many platforms. It's so awesome that female athletes are supported on and off the field so much. Um, so I think that I wish we grew up in this time a little bit. I wish we were in college now because it would have been a little bit easier. Um, but we got by. We got by with our waffles. Probably would have been a little better if we if we were, <laughs> ate a little bit healthier then. And that's why I wrote the book, because in terms of high performance, it really is all about raising the standard and chasing being optimal as an athlete. And yes, we could have gotten away with certain things in the past, but how much better could we have played? How much better could we have felt or maybe less anxious from from the mental side? Now, remind everyone, where'd you guys play soccer in college? We played at Fairfield University in Connecticut. Okay, so in terms of just not having the training specific to the female athlete, like what were some things that stood out as far as the strength program? Were you guys only doing like bench press or back squats or like just body weight or nothing at all? What did it look like? We always laugh that one of our testing, our strength tests was max lat pull down. And I just don't, to this day, it was just, it was really funny but like we you had to like you kept upping it every year you're getting to the point where we needed like two people on either side just to pull the weight down to like get us into the machine to be able to pull down that max weight but yeah I feel like um yeah uh in terms of training uh frequency we train we're trained too often it was oh I think we were all in a state of overtraining perpetual overtraining from preseason all the way through the season and the injuries you know, that resulted just on our team were a good, you know, providing support for the fact that we were probably all a little bit in a state of overtraining. But um, even like the relevancy of some of the the fitness tests and things were just not as relevant to the sport, the demands of the sport. And 
they were at that time, you know, we're, we were in college a while ago, they were, they were all thought by a lot of schools to be the relevant tests and the relevant things to be doing. So it wasn't, you know, just our program, it was just the norm then and now knowledge and a lot of, you know, research and, and stuff has, has steered teams in a little bit of a better training space. I did want to say too, this was not Fairfield's fault, but at the time, like female athletes, like you didn't, you, you thought that under eating was like the way to go to get fit. And we were even weighed, you know, and like, that was also the norm, like all the teams, like we're doing it. So in a combination of undernourishing ourselves and eating, not eating right. And then like training in a way that was not really tailored to female athletes and like having menstrual cycles and all of that. I just felt like we, if we knew what we knew that, like, if we know, knew what we knew now in terms of training and eating and all of that, I just feel like we would have been a stronger, healthier, mentally team too, because we would have felt better on a more consistent basis. And I'm sure Alana and Shannon, you can agree with that. Like, it's just was missing. That's what was missing. Yeah. And I think even on, when we speak to athletes on our podcast, that was even at the professional level a few years ago, like girls were getting weighed and told that they should be a certain size when that's not really, doesn't really make sense for a female athlete. Um, and it could lead to, you know, body dysmorphia and just different image issues with your body. Um, and I think another thing that we didn't have was um, like help on the mental side, which same thing with pros at all different levels. I think that now there's a lot more resources for people who have t sports psychologists or um, someone and, you know, someone specifically to help the team or players. Um, so I think that is a huge advantage now that that's accessible and that it's not something that's um, not spoken about or frowned upon. Like, I think just with, with that as well. So. There's a lot to unpack there. So first with the lat pull down, I mean, I was trying not to like cry laughing over here, but who got, who got the the highest max on that one? Doesn't even matter. <laughs> I don't remember that specifically, but I remember also another test was sit-ups, how many sit-ups you can do in 60 seconds. And everyone would just like yank on their shirt and just like bend their back. Like you're we were bleeding on our backs. Like we literally, our spines were bleeding. Why oh, did wow. we test? <laughs> <laughs> well, because that's also transferable to soccer and definitely not overtraining. <laughs> but it's so crazy to look back on it. And that wasn't too, too long ago either, which is kind of scary. But it's nice that we're starting to take a turn for the better. And like you mentioned, I think in the past few years, the, the women's game is progressing from that standpoint. So I'm going to read one of the passages in here. I found really, really interesting. Okay, we won't lie to you. It can be a confusing time to be absolutely run into the ground during preseason and then be expected to play at your best the next day. It can be discouraging to go from being healthy one minute to feeling like a sad puppy and watching everyone practicing while you're rehabbing an injury the next minute. We found ourselves flat out defeated in moments like this as we were going through our soccer careers. So let's talk about injuries you guys went through and some of the things you're starting to learn now in high performance and sports science that you would do differently. Well, I was going to say amongst the three of us, we had quite an array of injuries um I know Carly and Shannon you guys tore your ACL prior to going to Fairfield both of you oh well Shannon's was after but Carly's was prior um we had a we had a lot of injuries I'll, I tore ligaments in my ankle I herniated discs in my back um I broke my wrist playing soccer a lot of my personal injuries just to speak of my personal was probably uh, a result of nutrition issues and under eating and I was really underweight so I just could not handle being, it didn't matter how strong I was in the weight room. I couldn't handle full contact on a field with someone who was bigger than me and stronger than me. I was always the one to <laughs> bend and break to say, but um, yeah, I'm sorry. I even lost my train of thought in terms of what you were, were asking in terms of injury. Oh, what have we learned now to that has kind of changed that? I think all of us post-college really got very passionate about the nutrition side of things and uh, the training side of things as well. We are all certified in varying degrees of of everything having to do with that because I think that was something we really cared about educating ourselves on more so that we could educate our followers on it in the way that we didn't know when we were playing um yeah in terms of just from a training perspective like no one ever taught me how to run or how to move how to change direction efficiently and you know that is that's what one of the jobs that I have now too and when you change 
the you know mechanics of how someone's moving you can make them move a lot safer and a lot less prone to injury it's it's really crazy the way that you can change you know just the neurological patterns of someone and, and how they land and how they rotate um so I think a lot of that should be a part of every athlete's program because at the base of playing your sport, you're going to be moving. You can't predict how hard you're going to be hit or, or any of those things, but you're going to be landing. You're going to be jumping. You're going to be planting very hard. And if you can't do those things safely, you're just pretty much leaving yourself open to, you know, a laundry list of injuries like I had. <laughs> I can definitely speak to, I specifically remember I broke a part of my spine actually, when I was doing a back, a barbell squat. Um, and I remember like I had to wear like a corset like brace around my stomach and anyway it was really bad but like my in terms of my recovery like I didn't care I, I all I wanted to do was get back on the field so I wanted to rush I wanted to just like I don't care what I have to do let's get back on the field and my recovery habits were not good like I told I should have had a different mindset I should have been in the training room doing the extra stuff for recovery I should have been like caring a lot more about that and not rushing it because I just feel like it just led to just like, just getting injured and not, I don't know, not taking it well mentally. I just feel like if I took the time to like go into the training room and really work on like getting back into it, I would have just felt like so much better. And I would have got on the field and not gotten injured again. And I just, it's something that I personally wish I had better habits with back then for sure. I totally agree with everything you guys both just said. I, I would only add in something that I wish I did was be my own advocate after an injury. Um, just don't listen to what someone tells you and just be like, all right, that's what I'm going to do. Like actually think, is this going to be the best thing for me and my injury and the healing process? Uh, we had great trainers and everything, but every player and person is different. Um, so I would just make sure you're advocating for yourself, making sure you're doing everything you can for your your specific journey back to recovery. Recovery is probably one of my favorite chapters in this book, and it's really interesting to see now in today's girls' soccer landscape just how packed the schedule is year-round. And even at the ECNL level, it's like a lot of these girls are tallying more games and more practices and more training sessions than college players and the pros. It's so tough to see because it's like, look, you can be as strong as you want, but if you're not recovering or managing your load, things are still really sketchy. Like you're not chasing high performance if you're under recovered. So I'm really glad you guys brought that up. Now, there was another passage in here about the, the mental piece and feeling anxious about certain things. So let me just read through this one. Looking back, we can't believe the amount of pressure we put on ourselves during spring fitness sessions in college. We would anxiously text each other the night before, trying to guess what the 6 a.m. running would be for the next day. We remember being upset, getting sick during sessions, and even peeing our pants at the track. So let's unpack that a little bit and just expand on why you included that in the forward and why were you so anxious about these tests? Did you not feel prepared in your performance? Like, what was it? Where do we even begin with that? I feel like there was just the culture was you have to be really good at these fitness tests to be seen as, you know, a player that's worthy of like playing. And I just feel like, I remember, like you said, it, like we said in the passage, like I just remember stress eating at night and then feeling sick to my stomach before the fitness testing, because like how much we all worked each other up <laughs> about the fitness. There was a lot of anxiety around that. And I feel like maybe it did come from lack of confidence, like just feeling like, oh my gosh, like they're putting so much pressure on these fitness tests rather than like being a good soccer player. And I think that happened across the board during this time too. Like this was not just our school. Like we know so many other players who played at other schools who felt the same way with their, the culture of their teams as well. What, what were yeah. the fitness tests you guys had? We had the mile, the time right. mile. We had, <laughs> we had the lap pull down test. Now we had a few, a few strength tests, uh, like bench, lap pull down and, uh, something else crazy uh but the the fitness tests were the my timed mile the beep test um 300 yard shuttles a 5105 pro agility test and i think that was it 
there's one more I'm missing in there. But those were those were the main those were the ones that stick in the <laughs> stick in the brain. It's a little scary. Oh, the hundreds. So when you think about that, that is an insane number of things. And granted, we were tested on all of those within the span of two days. Right. So you're and giving then you you wonder why everyone tears their ACL in preseason. We were set, we were not only like, and this is this was the norm for all schools. You did your fitness tests in the morning at 6 a.m. one. You then maybe came back in the afternoon for another thing of fitness testing. This was in the beginning. And then at night you you played, you scrimmaged while you were like literally dead from 11 to 11. <laughs> yeah, a full field freaking scrimmage. And that and then the next day, whatever fitness tests we had left over, if there are more, you did them in the morning. And then we had another two practices after that. But it, that was the norm. That was very much so the norm. I do think that's one of the most relatable things that we talk about is like fitness and the stress around fitness. So I know it's still a very relevant thing for teams. But I do feel like when we went, there was like a little bit of like, yeah, we don't want you to know what you have coming up. Like stay on your toes. And like I training and fitness is not, that makes no sense. Like if we program out speed and strength, we should know exactly that. We're going to have two top speed days a week. We're going to have acceleration days. You know, we're going to have, this many lifts, I, the guessing game and the unknown factor of it really served no purpose other than to just literally have us on our toes all the time. I do think we all stress each other out more just by like <laughs> the unknown of it all. But uh, yeah, the unknown thing was, it was a little crazy. I think you guys really foreshadowed the conditioning chapter in, in those few sentences because I call out the the timed miles, I think like the Cooper test and a few others that are just a bit ridiculous and don't translate to the game. But I also call out, you know, conditioning used as punishment after a loss and just really putting your players in a high risk position for injury. So it's, it's really important to just get the message out there that we, we want our girls to be healthy. We want them to perform at a high level and we can't have them do that if we're running them into the ground. So I'm glad that you guys talked through that experience. And I do want to end on a, a positive note because you did kick off the book of all of the struggles you went through, but you also mentioned in your forward that that we need to leave the game better than we found it. And that's something that echoes in the back of your minds. And that's what you want to just inspire young girls with. So how are you guys each leaving the game better than you found it with what you're doing now with soccer girl problems? I think just like what you're doing and what your book is doing, I think we're just trying to give everyone the tools and the resources to help them to learn things that we didn't have accessible when we were playing. Um, I think that's a big part of it. I think we've always started with humor and I think that's still what we do because it's something that connects us all. Um, so I think that we just want everyone to enjoy the game and goes along with this, our podcast too. Each time we list, we talk with someone, it's just like, we are so lucky that we get to play this game and it's done so many great things for us. So that's what we want to remember the great things and not like the, the anxiety and the stress and everything. There's so many other great things that the game has left gave, given us. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like even like, despite all of the things that we can make fun of now in hindsight and laugh about with our experience, we obviously loved our soccer experience. We, we wouldn't still be doing a job in soccer if the sport didn't mean so much to us and if we didn't love it so much. So we just are always like, how much better would our experience have been if we were healthy all the time, if we felt more confident because, you know, we were training correctly and worrying about the right things, how much more positively would we have felt about ourselves if we, we knew how to fuel ourselves correctly and to take like pride in, in fueling ourselves. So as we're just like, if all those things, those were the things that if anything, you know, tainted our soccer experience a little bit, cause we just didn't have the knowledge about it. But if anyone today can, can have those tools going forward as a middle school or going into high school or, you know, a freshman going into their senior, like going throughout high school, uh, I just feel like that could change someone's experience and make it that much more incredible. And to just end, cause I love both of what you said. At the end of the day, we just want players to just also speak up and talk about how you're feeling. And whenever you feel like something's off, just speak about it with your teammates. With, I mean, we became a viral Twitter account in 2011 because of how honest and open we were on Twitter with our problems. And I feel like if more players are feeling this, if they feel the way, you know, unhappy or uncomfortable, or they want to just, you know, like get over a, a, a I don't know, a bad game, just talking to someone and being honest and just saying how you feel 
whether it's with a therapist or your team or your parents, like just, it will make you a healthier and happier player. Don't hold that in. Like it's not going to help you, (laughs) but just be open about it. And I think it will really carry you through and get you to that next level. That's really brilliant, you guys. And I will say in in your forward, you do talk a lot about your struggles uh, and what you wish you knew and what you would have changed. But you also do talk about the memories and the good times and just hanging out with the team and traveling. And that's really what it's about too. And I think a lot of the girls reading this book are going to really appreciate the mental chapter for that reason, because the game is more than just about winning. (laughs) So I am really excited for everyone to read that part of the book, but your forward was amazing and I couldn't have thought of a better way to start this. So thank you for writing it. And everyone, this book's going to be out on Black Friday. So when y'all are hanging around with your family on Thanksgiving, relaxing, just pop over to Amazon. It's going to be on sale all through Cyber Monday. So hope you can snag that and Thank you again, Soccer Girl Problems, and I'll see you guys on the next episode.